Hello everyone, I'm Raphael and welcome to my channel, Network Engineer Pro. If this is your first time here, welcome. And if you've been here before, then welcome back. In this video, I'll be talking about NAT. No, not that NAT. Come on, <laughs> get out of here. NAT, N-A-T, which stands for Network Address Translation. At the most basic level, NAT lets us translate one set of IP addresses to another. So maybe like a private address to a public address, or maybe even a private address to a private address. That sounds cool and all, but why do I care? The original purpose of NAT was to use it to slow down the consumption of IPv4 addresses. IPv4 has about 4.2 billion addresses available, and with the rapid growth of the internet in the late 80s and 90s, it was realized pretty quick that, yep, we're probably gonna run out. Right now, there's almost 8 billion people in the world, so definitely not enough for every one person to have a device with a unique IP address. And with that impending doom of IP address exhaustion being anticipated was the main reason for creating things like or classless interdomain routing and NAT network address translation back in the 90s. And it's a great thing they did because in 2011, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, IANA, which is like the organization that oversees and manages global address spaces, guess what they did? They allocated the last slash eight address block. IPv6 is another option to address IPv4 address exhaustion, but that's a topic for another day. And with that being said, let's take a deep dive and see how NAT works. Okay, so here's a simple topology for how NAT works at your home. After I explain this, I wanna show you an example of how NAT is typically done at the enterprise level. Over here in blue, this is our inside network. This is the network in our home, our private internal home network. We have our home router. Maybe it's something that AT&T provided you when you signed up for their internet service. They also provided you with one public IP address of 11.11.11.11. Everything inside your house, like PCs, laptops, iPhones, iPads, whatever, they get an IP address address, and they're typically provided from one of these three ranges. Now, these private IP address ranges are defined in RFC 1918. So let's say, for example, that our internal network at our house has a block of IPs from the 10.10.10.0 slash 24 range. So anything inside my home is going to be assigned something from this range. So PC1 has an IP address of dot one. Let's also say that PC1 wants to ping 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 which is a DNS server out on the internet. And if that IP address looks familiar, it is. It's actually the IP address of Google's public DNS server. So when PC1 pings the 8.8.8.8, .8 it's going to go ahead and build a packet. Now, inside of that packet, we're going to have a source and destination IP address. The source IP address is going to be the IP address of PC1. So 10.10.10. .10 .10 one the destination ip address is going to be the destination ip of 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 right that's who we want to ping so 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 is going to be our destination ip the pc builds that packet and sends it out onto the internal network it arrives at the home router the home router receives a packet that packet has a source ip of 10.10.10.1 and a destination ip of 8.8.8.8 .8 the home router knows it needs to send that out towards the internet so that packet is forwarded out towards the internet towards its destination it arrives on the dns server the dns server receives the packet processes it analyzes it does whatever it needs to do and it's going to go ahead and send a reply that reply is going to have a source ip address of 8.8.8.8 and a destination ip of 10.10.10.1 .10 I mean, it received a packet with a source IP of 10.10.10.1. It only makes sense that it needs to send it back to 10.10.10.1. So the DNS server builds that packet and sends it out towards the internet. When it arrives at the ISP, the internet service provider routers are going to drop it. It gets dropped big time. Why? Because look at this destination IP address. This destination IP address is 10.10.10.1. That is inside the RFC 1918 address space. These addresses are considered non-routable. And because the RFC 1918 IPs are non-routable, they're not allowed to be routed on the public internet. They are meant to be used and reused in private internal network. So because the packet gets dropped, it never makes it to its destination. So we see the problem. Let's look at how NAT fixes it. Let me clear the screen just a little bit. So like I mentioned earlier, our home router has one public IP address assigned. It's this 11.11.11.11. .11 and same scenario, PC1 wants to ping 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 which is out on the internet. PC1 builds its packet, and you can see here its source IP address is 10.10.10.1, and the destination is 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. That packet gets forwarded through the internal network and arrives on the home router. When it arrives on the home router, the source IP is 10.10.10.1 .10 and the destination is 
8.8.8. Now, this router, this home router is configured for NAT. And because of that, it's going to do something special. It's going to take that source IP address of 10.10.10.1 and translate it to 11.11.11.11. .11 .11 .11. Dot 11 and specifically it's translating the source IP address so it's taking the source IP address of 10.10.10.1 and swapping it or translating it to 11.11.11.11 .11 when the router does these NAT translations every single one that it does it's keeping track of them and it's putting them inside of something called a NAT translation table and it's really important that they do this i'll explain this in a few minutes so like i said the source ip address just got translated and it's forwarded out to the isp the isp routes that towards its destination just like before so it arrives at the dns server that 8.8.8.8 the dns server takes a packet processes it and sends its reply so when it sends its reply it builds a packet of its own that packet is going to have a source ip address of 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 .8 and a destination of 11.11.11.11, right? It received a packet with a source IP of 11.11.11.11. Makes sense that it needs to send it back to 11.11.11.11. That's why that IP address is in the destination field. So the server sends the packet back out towards the internet. It arrives at the ISP. The ISP says, okay, I just received a packet with a destination IP address of 11.11.11.11. There is no issue here because that destination IP 11.11.11.11 is not part of RFC 1918. It's a globally routable IP address. So there is no issue here. The ISP will route the packet back to the home router. When that packet arrives at the home router, this is what the contents look like. The source IP is 8.8.8.8. The destination is 11.11.11.11. So the packet arrives at the home router. Source is 8.8.8.8. Destination is 11.11.11.11. The router sees that and it says, hold on, I remember this. There, there's something familiar about this. Let me check my NAT translation table because... I, I remember that not too long ago, I natted that. I translated something to 11.11.11.11. So, yep, I just checked my translation table. I natted this for sure. So, what it's going to do is it's going to reverse the translation. So, remember this translation we did here earlier from 10.10.10.1 .10 .10 .10 to 11.11.11.11? It gets translated back. The router is going to reverse the translation. So what it's going to do specifically to the packet is that this destination IP address is going to be changed to 10.10.10.1. And that destination IP address is routable inside of our private internal network. And it gets routed appropriately back to PC1. Something I want to mention is that even though in this specific step during the reverse translation, technically the destination IP address here was translated. We are not doing destination NAT. This is still source NAT. All we're doing is reversing the original translation. Okay, so now we saw how NAT typically works at your home. I want to take it a little bit further and show you how NAT works typically at the enterprise. So in this diagram, I have the inside enterprise network 10.10.10.0 slash 24. On the right in red, we have the internet. And in the middle, we have our NAT enabled internet edge router. We connect to our ISP using a slash 30 IP address. This is going to be your WAN point to point. And we have a public block of IP addresses, specifically 11.11.11.0 slash 29. This block of IP addresses could be owned by the enterprise or provided to you from the ISP. So let's go ahead and take our example where PC1 wants to ping 8.8.8.8 out on the internet. So PC1, we know, is in the 10.10.10.0 slash 24 network. It builds a packet with a source IP address of 10.10.10.1, a destination IP address of 8.8.8.8. That packet gets routed through the internal network and arrives at the NAT router sitting at the internet edge. When that packet arrives, it has a source IP of 10.10.10.1 and a destination of 8.8.8.8. This NAT router has been configured with a static mapping, a one-to-one -one mapping from a private address to a public address. Specifically, 10.10.10.1 has been statically mapped to 11.11.11.1. 
Because the NAT enabled router is configured with a static NAT mapping, it's going to change the source IP address, right? We're doing source NAT from 10.10.10.1 to 11.11.11.1. .11 .11 .1. After the translation takes place, the router is going to store this translation here in its NAT translation table. It's then going to route the packet out on the internet and it eventually makes it to the DNS server. The DNS server receives this packet and it's going to process it and send a reply of its own. When it builds its reply packet, that packet's going to have a source IP address of 8.8.8.8 and a destination of 11.11.11. .11 .11. One. The DNS server will then send that packet back onto the internet towards the destination, the NAT router. And there's no issue here because that destination, 11.11.11.1, is a globally routable IP address. When the packet arrives on the NAT enabled router, this is what the contents look like. The source IP address is 8.8.8.8. The destination is 11.11.11.1. So like I mentioned in the last example, these NAT enabled routers are keeping track of all the translations. So when the NAT enabled router receives a packet with a destination IP address of 11.11.11.1, .11 it's gonna look at its NAT translation table and say, okay, you know what? I have an entry for that. I translated that earlier. I need to translate it back. I need to reverse the translation. So what it's going to do is it's gonna take the destination IP address here of 11.11.11.1 .11 and reverse the translation. So it's gonna be 10.10.10.1. After the destination IP address is translated back to the private IP of 10.10.10.1, it can go ahead and be routed back onto the internal enterprise network back to its original host, so PC1. And again, even though in this specific step, we translated the destination IP back to 10.10.10.1, this is not destination NAT. This is source NAT. All we're doing is reversing the original translation. We know what to reverse it to because we kept track of it in our NAT translation table. In this specific example where I translated one private IP address to one public IP address, right? That specific static one-to-one -one manual mapping, that is static NAT. If for some reason PC2 wanted to talk to 8.8.8.8, .8 whether ping or DNS queries, whatever, we would need to add another NAT translation entry on the NAT router. So we'd have to go into the NAT router and configure a static mapping for 10.10.10.2 translating to 11.11.11.2. You can see how with static NAT, it's not very scalable if you have a large block of IPs that you need to be translating to. A more scalable option is gonna be dynamic NAT using pools. The way that works is that on the NAT enabled router, you're gonna configure a NAT pool. So a pool from 11.11.11.0 slash 29. Every time someone from the inside needs to talk to the outside and NAT needs to happen, the router is going to dynamically translate you with the first available IP address in the pool. So in our example, 11.11.11.1. .11 now PC2 needs to talk to the outside. When traffic goes through the NAT enabled router, it's automatically or dynamically going to be translated to 11.11.11.2. .11 if somebody else needs to talk to the internet, Guess what the NAT enabled router is going to do? It's going to take the next available IP address from this pool. So PC3 is going to be translated into dot three. The next host is going to get dot four. The next host is going to get dot five until the pool is full. Again, this is all happening dynamically. You don't have to go on the router every single time and create a static NAT mapping. We will let our configured NAT pool do that for us. Earlier I mentioned that the NAT enabled router keeps track of all of the NAT translations. Those translations are located in a table called the NAT translation table. On Cisco iOS, you can view the NAT translation table by entering show IP NAT translations. When you're looking at the NAT translation table, there are some new terms that we need to know about. In the world of NAT, we have a concept of inside and outside, local, and global. The inside typically refers to the enterprise or the private network. Outside typically refers to the public internet. Not only that, IP addresses are classified as either local or global. 
a local address is the address as seen from the inside. So how does the private enterprise LAN see an address? Global is how the address is seen by devices on the outside. Now, if we combine these terms, we have inside global, inside local, outside local, and outside global. In this specific NAT translation output, I configured a static NAT mapping for the inside IP of 10.10.10.1 .10 to 11.11.11.1. After I did that configuration, I checked the NAT translation table. So let's break it down. What I wanna do is I wanna cover inside first, then we'll cover outside. Let's talk about the inside local first. The inside local IP addresses, these are the IP addresses that are assigned to the inside devices. So the devices inside of our private network, so like PC1 or PC2. These inside local IP addresses, these are not advertised outside to the internet. The internet has no idea how to reach our private subnet 10.10.10.0 slash 24. That's why we have the name local. So inside local is the easiest one to remember. The next one I want to talk about is inside global. The inside global address, this is the address after NAT was completed. So what was 10.10.10.1 translated to? That would be the public IP address the ISP gave us. So 11.11.11.1. .11 Again, it's what IP does the inside host have after NAT was done. So it's the inside host as it's seen from the outside. So the global internet knows how to reach 11.11.11.1 .11 because it's a public IP address. So it's global. We call it inside because it's representing something on the inside network and specifically PC1 in this example. So again, it's the IP address of the inside host after it was NATed. Then we have the outside local. Now the outside local, this is the IP address of the outside host, like the public DNS server from Google, the 8.8.8.8, as it's seen from the perspective of the local network. So how does the inside network see that outside IP address? Then we have outside global. The outside global address is addresses that are on the outside. They are assigned to devices out on the public internet like 8.8.8.8. It's also how they are seen. So 8.8.8.8 is a globally routable address. That's how it's seen from the outside internet. In this specific example, the outside local and the outside global are the same because I configured source net. Those two would be different if I was working with destination net. Now destination net is not on the CCNA exam. So inside local, the IP address of the inside host from the inside network, right? The local enterprise network. Inside global is the IP address of the inside host after it's been translated with NAT, typically a public IP address. Then we have outside local, which is the IP address of the outside host as it's seen from the local network. Then we have outside global, the IP address of the outside host as seen from the perspective of the outside. All right, so now you have an understanding on how NAT works and why we need it. Join me in the next few videos where I hit the CLI and I show you how to configure NAT on Cisco routers. I really hope you found this video helpful. If so, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And you can follow Network Engineer Pro on Facebook. All the links are in the description. That's it for now. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.